Welcome to the last lecture of this year's Cinematic Migrations Experiment in Thinking, Action, and Form. My name is Renee Green. I'm an artist, writer, and filmmaker, but also professor and director of the MIT program in Art, Culture, and Technology. Before I introduce our guest, Samin Farkande, today, I'd like to make a brief detour. This is the last lecture of this academic year, but Cinematic Migrations, the lectures, uh, the screenings and seminars will uh, resume uh, for another year in the fall, thanks to our partners, the MIT Visiting Artist Program, and we will again welcome our guest, the acclaimed film director, John Acampra, and producer, Lena Gopal, uh, from their London-based production company, Smoking Dogs Films. Lecture series like the cinematic migrations activities that have been our object of analysis, pleasure, and production during this year are collective operations. It is today that I would like to take a moment to thank the individuals that have made these events uh, what I perceive to be a very stimulating endeavor. First of all, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for being here. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, it has been encouraging to observe an increasingly eclectic and engaged public sharing our interest. Um, and I hope you will be returning. Laura uh, Kiki-san has been regularly thanked by our guest for her invaluable help in coordinating all aspects of their complex travels and schedules, making their visit something they remember fondly. But Laura has also created uh, the, the enticing graphic image for the poster Cinematic Migrations uh, and been um, a huge help through all of this. And, uh, for this and many more things, I'd like to thank you, Laura, um, for supporting us. You're welcome. <laughs> I'd like to uh, also thank Madeline Gallagher for rising to meet the many technical challenges that all of our guests have brought, um, Andrew Newman for filming the lectures, and Carson Salter for his discreet and useful engagement, as well as uh, David Kudo, uh, and all who provide tech support uh, and set up the cube for these events. Thank you. Um, quite a few people to thank. Um, I'd also like to mention and thank all of ACT uh, that have made this lecture series such a joy. Of course, uh, ACT's program officer, Marion Cunningham, but also Val Grimm and Mike Enos, and my ACT colleagues, Joan Jonas, Genemina Serbonos, Research affiliate Nomad Arbonas, Azra Aksamija, uh, Antoni Muntadas, Angel Navares, Jaisal Kapadia, Florian Hecker, and especially uh, Howie Chen, with whom I have co taught this semester's seminar component of sem cinematic migrations. Ye Jin Shin has been my engaged teaching assistant and interlocutor, Javier. Javier Angara Phipps has been very uh, helpful and engaged uh, as a research, ACT research affiliate and supporter of uh, cinematic migrations. And lastly, my particular thanks to all the amazing filmmakers, artists, and scholars who have participated in this season and to the School of Architecture and Planning and the Institute for making all of this possible. So. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> now, I'd like to welcome Simin Farkande. Thanks for your patience, Simin. Um, over the last two decades, Simin Farkande has moved around a constellation that includes independent media video forms, performance, and media literacy, literacy concerns. She has worked with Paper Tiger TV, which she also directed, uh, the Women One World Collective, and she has worked significantly in both the German and Iranian contexts. Farkande's work 
plays with the dynamic intersection between media, art, and politics. She is an award-winning filmmaker, artist, educator, and activist. From 1995 to 2003, she produced and directed the acclaimed monthly TV show, Labor at the Crossroads. Her films have been screened at the Whitney Biennial, Margaret Mead Film Festival, and Museum of Modern Art, as well as on PBS and the BBC Channel 4. Farquhar's personal work includes Caught Between Two Worlds, 2007, a documentary about the Iranian diaspora in the US, and Who Gives Kisses Freely from Her Lips, 2009, the film that um, I remember the process of making um, for quite some time, and I'm very happy that she was able to produce it. Um, this film uh, combines fact and fiction to discuss temporary marriage in Iran. In addition to teaching film, video arts, and communications theories at the School of Visual Arts in New York, Farkande is the education director at the news program Democracy Now! For over 20 years, I've been able to witness her work as a dynamic activist and artist. As a, co as a colleague, we've worked together in creating productions as well as in relation to media literacy. And as a friend through and between many times and many worlds. Tonight's talk, is entitled, Bestow, Media Literacy, Expose, Inspire, Change. Please join me in welcoming Sineen Farkande. <laughs> okay. um, thank you everyone for coming and um, thank you for that wonderful introduction and Thank you for ACT for inviting me and for all the team work that went into making this possible. And I'm hoping that I can pull it off because um, there's readings, there is a PowerPoint and DVDs. So um, can we? Okay, um, there was many routes I could have gone with this talk and uh, cinematic migrations, the, the phrase really took me to many places. Um, as I was thinking about it, one of the things I was thinking about is how um, this cinema of migration, cinematic migration is about migration over time, but also migration over borders. And for me that meant a lot, um, both in terms of my experience um, in the world and in terms of uh, my interests in film. And I would like to explore that with you. Um, but at times I will jump from one area to another, which um, hopefully will make sense. And if not, then let's talk about why it doesn't later. But I want to talk about, uh, I want to start with a personal, with few personal stories. Um, as I was thinking about cinematic migration, of course, story came to mind, storytelling, the whole notion of story and its migration. And I started thinking about how story came to me um, in its earliest form. What I could remember was living as a child in Tehran um, on a street where um, when vendors would come with uh, sour almonds, I mean green almonds and sell them or in the summertime or with uh, beets in the fall that were steaming uh, in the cold that you could eat warm. And uh, there was another thing that was there every, all the time throughout the year, and that was a peddler, a showman who would come with this um, kind of strange object machine called like a peep box, really. Uh, in Farsi, it was called Shahre Farang, meaning literally land of uh, foreign, foreign land. But this showman would bring this on his back and would set it down and kids would come and would look into the window and he would pull this paper through and stories of Thousand One Nights and poetry and Persian mythology were 
being told through that. So that's my earliest remembrance. Um, in those times, I mean, today I have a seven-year-old. She has tons of books. I don't remember that many books with images being around, but this I remember. Um, and it was a kind of a moving image, kind of a cinematic migration, literally as he was going with this paper-made, handmade cinema through the streets of Tehran and telling stories. Um, another thing that I was thinking about when I first started sitting down for this lecture was um, something that has to do with media and its importance in our world and in the world at large, not only in the United States and Iran, but in so many places. And that was the image of um, during the revolution, during 1978, 79, as a kid, um, being exposed to this event of the revolution. Uh, I remember this very profound moment where I was staying at a friend's house, sleepover, and uh, it happened to be on the way, the route of getting to the radio TV station in Tehran. And we went outside and the bullets are flying because clearly there was a struggle going on to get the radio station, radio TV station. And as we went inside, there was a, um, a suit-clad man in a tie telling, speaking uh, the program. It was called Donesh, meaning knowledge. He was giving the program uh, called knowledge. It was a program of science and inquiry symbolizing with his tie, of course, the, that time, the Shah's time, and a regime that was very different from what's now. Um, and as we were watching this, suddenly a revolutionary came, pushed him aside, you know, on television. He's moved aside, and he came up and said, we've gotten the radio TV station. It's ours. And that profound moment of understanding the importance of media in struggle, in all struggle, uh, that we are involved in uh, has stayed with me. And I always thought, oh, I should use it in some movie, but I haven't done that yet. But at any rate, um, I wanted to transmit that because when, when I'm thinking about media literacy, one aspect of that is, is access, right? Access to the means of production, access to the radio TV station. So I wanted to share those two stories with you, um, which come from now over 30, three decades ago, 30 years ago, and um, so much has happened since in our world, but also in the Iranian context. And as I move forward in, in the lecture, I want to look at several examples of Iranian cinema that I think have been able to migrate over time and over borders to become ambassadors, in a way, for uh, the people in Iran who may not be able to Oh, have not been able to, um, many of them, come out of Iran. And now I want to get to my um, written text, which I hope I can get to. When the revolution was underway during the seven, late 70s, we read many sources to understand what was happening. It was a lesson in media literacy and critical thinking. I learned to question and challenge the dominant narrative presented by the media at that time. I learned to read between the lines. Um, it can be said that such a tradition already existed in poetry and in literature in Iran due to its history. Um, even over the last 120 years, the changes, the government changes, uh, but even before that um, have, um, impacted um, the art, the writing, the literature, and the poetry that has come out of Iran. When a new cinema was born in the 60s, it naturally became a cinema of resistance. It was an art cinema often referred to as Iranian New Wave. It did not have manifestos as did Cinema Novo in Brazil or Imperfect Cinema of Cuba. Um, but in, in the Iranian manifestation of a third cinema uh, or a new wave, cinema. Um, it was a cinema that understood to speak and that was forced to speak between the lines and was forced to be read by its viewers as such as well. Often um, it is said that the film Gov or Cow, which was produced in 1969 by uh, Mehjui, 
often that film is seen as the new wave that embodied the new wave that came out of Iran at the time. Um, but there are many early examples of films that were made by filmmakers in um, small budget uh, ways. Although they were film, uh, they were made in, in, um, through schools or through, um, uh, well, uh, through small funding that was available uh, at the time. Also, in the Shah's time and in, in uh, the later time, there was um, a fund available for small films, short films. But, uh, um, but the film The House is Black, which was made by Farouk Farouk Saad in 1962, is perhaps the real um, early, the real new wave embodiment, I think. Um, Farouk Saad, who was a feminist, a poet, and editor, um, had this as their, her only film. She had edited quite a few films, but this one uh, was her own. Um, and it's only a 22-minute short film, um, starting not only um, the idea of bringing poetry into Iranian cinema, literally her own, because she was a poet that um, was speaking publicly and in her poetry about desire, about sexuality, um, about uh, women's positions, um, and also in her actions. She was someone that uh, was not afraid to um, have a divorce, to, to have an extramarital relationship, things that were taboo and are still taboo, heavily taboo today. But in this film, um, The House is Black, she goes to a, a colony, a leper colony in the north of Iran, uh, again breaking a taboo and really questions in this very poetic film um, the, the whole notion of uh, what leprosy is and also uh, within the film creates um, a new type of language for Iranian cinema. In this film, I'm going to show you just um, about five, five or six minutes of it, uh, but in this film uh, you have the voice of Farah Sad, which um, has her poetry making the viewer aware of the beauty of the people that she is um, engaging with, uh, juxtaposed with a medical voice that actually breaks the, um, breaks the myths about uh, what leprosy really is. Uh, but beyond that, as you see the film in its literal sense, you, you see the film also uh, if you watch it. And I do invite you, uh, all of the films I'm going to show tonight, I'm going to show clips, but they're, on, they're available and I invite you to go and look at them in their entirety. Um, she creates this um, film that is also a critique of society um, and um, a critique of the reasons for poverty. Of course, the film was censored immediately, um, not only because it was critical, um, but also because it showed a village. And um, in the time of, in the 1960s, the government of Iran was very, very um, intensely trying to modernize and did not tolerate any images that might show it as backwards um, in any way. So any images of the village became uh, threatening. The film was uh, censored along with um, several other, well, many other films uh, to come, but several other films of the time specifically because it showed rural life. <clears throat> so maybe what we can do is, this is the first film. Uh, we can go to actually the first clip. بر ما زیرا که روز رو به زبان نهاده است و سایه های عصر دراز می شوند و هستی ما چون قفسی که پر از پرندگان باشد از ناله های اصارت لبریز است و در میان ما کسی نیست که بداند کتاب که خواهد بود موسم حساد گذشت و تابستان تمام شد و ما نجات نیافتیم 
مانند فاخت برای انصاف مینالی و نیست انتظار نور میکشی و اینک ظلمت است ستاره ناهید گاهی سر شب ستاره پر نوری میبینیم اسم این ستاره ناهید است ستاره ناهید خیلی روشن است ستاره ناهید به ما خیلی نزدیک است اما ستاره ناهید به ما چشمک نمیزند چرا باید برای داشتن پدر و مادر خدا را شکر کرد؟ بابا بود من نمیدانم من عشق بودم ندارم خود اسم چند تا چیز قشنگ رو بگو ما خورشید گل بازی تو حالا اسم چند تا چیز زشت بگو دست یا جمله بنویس که کلمه خونه تون باشه و تو ای نهر سرشار که نفس مهر تو را میراند به سوی ما بیا به سوی ما بیا Rukhsad died, unfortunately, in a car accident in 1967. So this remained her last film, but it set a tone uh, for cinema to come, both in terms of use of poetics and uh, in terms of creating resistance cinema. Um, the, the next film I want to show in a, few in a few minutes is called The Cow, and both these films um, probably are the first ones to actually come outside as um, uh, films that migrated clandestinely. Um, the Cow was also censored. Uh, it was a feature by Merjui and um, again set in a village, um, rural area. Um, and um, even though at first it was shown in, in the Shah's time, it was absolutely not allowed to leave the country. Um, it, it did leave the country um, clandestinely and made it to the Venice Film Festival as the first migrating um, new wave cinema of Iran. Um, so it's become sort of a classic, much more known than The House is Black because of that legacy. But also later, um, during uh, the revolution, it or after the revolution, it had um, a meaningful um, historic, uh, meaningful um, situation because it was seen as uh, a pivotal or, or 
it being seen by the Islamic Republic's leaders was seen as a pivotal moment where they realized that there could be um, a cinema. I mean, after the revolution, there was no Western um, cinema allowed to go to Iran. So there was really a block of that. And perhaps in some ways, that led uh, filmmakers to have a moment to hear their own culture and creativity. But um, by seeing the cow, there was um, new possibilities created that there could be a cinema that would be um, a cinema of Iran. Um, but it was already happening, obviously. Um, and uh, when, when the film came to the Venice Film Festival in 69, it became the event of the festival, even though it was not um, scheduled um, to be seen. Um, Before we go, go on and, and look at this segment, before, before you started, um, I just want to say that the village was seen as a metaphor for the country or even the society, ide ideologically inspired by the, um, this film, particularly by Italian neorealism, but aesthetically and thematically akin to uh, cinema novo and uh, notions of third cinema. The new wave filmmakers wished to make films that spoke out against the increased centralization of power within the government to do so, though required to bury the messages through subtle symbolism in an effort to escape government censors. Um, sure, it did not escape government censors, but um, for the while that it did have a run in the cinemas, it um, created uh, quite a, uh, an uproar. And it, it's a feature film. Uh, we'll, we'll watch just about 10 minutes of it. But um, it is the story, the, the overall stories of a, a man whose only um, livelihood is his cow in this village, the cow that gives milk, the cow that um, gives life to the, uh, that can work with him on the field and so forth. Um, and he, he's very fond of this cow. Uh, after he goes away for a day and comes back, um, the cow is gone. It's lost. And the villagers lie to him and say, well, it ran away. But he knows deep down that it must, something must have happened to him, and the cow has actually died. Um, but everyone in the village decides to lie to him. And the, uh, the whole story really is around this idea of um, covering up things that are happening, things that happen in society. And the, um, outcome of that. So that's the overall context. But throughout the film, you also see um, worry towards um, worry because there is um, uh, the, the so called, in the film, there's a group called Bouleries who are um, probably the, the stand in for the secret uh, service who come and take things from the village without their um, being able to um, stop, stop that theft. Um, so over the course of this film, we won't see this, but I hope you will uh, when you go check it out. Um, over the course of the film, the villagers finally organize to um, create a small um, uprising to stop this theft that is happening uh, from their small village and from their very meager, uh, poor livelihood. Um, but the, throughout the film, well, you will see in the beginning of the film um, the... the um, well, maybe we should just play it, and we'll, I'll, I'll tell you more as we, we see it.
خدا. این پسر مک سفر از وقتی از شهر برگشته ما همینجوری آتیش میسود این چیزاش خوب یاد گرفته خوب خوش مشت اصلا که گابش برده سهرا تو این هم که یه گاب بیشتر نیست
دلم رفته سنا پیدا ماستم شد به زیر چشم ما گندم بکنیم تا به چشم ما دریا ماستم شد علی جلو بیا اینو یاد بینا بچه بگید چشم مشتی راتی مشتی این بیچاره منتظره که یه چیکی شیر ازت بگیره برده بودم ای سهرا بهش نده بریدش بکنه بهش کن دیگه بچه چه خبرت مجد ازن اخبار خیلی تو همه بازم لام از سب این بلوری ها پیداشون شده چی؟ بلوری؟ کجا؟ الله اکبر تو پیو کن نه تو گفتم باره کنار دیگه برگشتنی بالای تپه دیدم اشون چند تا بودن؟ مثل همیشه همون ستایی هم میبینی کت خدا؟ میبینی؟ من هی میگم فکری چاره ای بکنی هیشکی گوشش بده کار نی حالا چی کار بکنیم نه؟ والا دست ما چه کاری ساخته است؟ این بلوریا که دین و ایمون حسابی نداره مگه خدا خودش چاره بابا تو اگه ما هم کاری نکنیم روشون زیادتر میشه اومدن سه تا گوسفند منو بردن من خونه خراب شدم بابا هیچ کی هم هیچ کارشون نکرد حالا لابد نوبت گاب مشتسنه آه نوبت ما نه بابا خدا نکنه اصلا نوبت توی مشتسن خلاصش میگن کت خلاص من تا اسم بلوری رو میشنفم و خونم به جوش میاد هر جوری شده بالاخره تلافیشو در میارم مثلا چی کار میکنی؟ یه کاریش میکنم یه کاریش میکنم آقا تو مثل سگ از بلوری ها میترسی چی کارشو میتونی بکنی؟ آقا خدر کنی کارا عجب به سره بروی ها برادر من عزیز ما خوش تو مجد از تو نبر بیرون دیگه از صبح آفتاب نزده بردی سهرا چی کار؟ راست میگه مشتی گاب آبستن میبری سهرا که چی؟ بزه تو تبیله خورده راحت کنه دیگه وقت زایدن شبا ایشالا مارک ها باشه مارک ها باشه کجا مشتی حاله دقه باش باز ببرمش تویله میخوام یه ذره راحت کنم و بخوابم چهله سهرم باید برم میشو عملگی یا علی دست علی به همراه زن اون فانوس رو بده بینم
canım. Bir 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 bir. Oha, oha. It's a feature, so it takes some time to get the sense of it, of course. Um, we only saw a very small portion of it. Um, the beginning foreshadows how uh, Hassan ends up in the end. Um, he, when he finds out that his cow is gone, he slowly starts <coughs> taking on the characteristics of a cow and starts mooing and eating hay, and the villagers don't know what to do with him. He, he just He can't get over the fact that the cow is gone and he starts believing that he is one. And um, the villagers, in the end, uh, treat him like an animal, and he dies. Um, so it's a very tr tragic state of affairs. But in the meanwhile, all these other things are happening as well um, to, through the village. Um, and uh, Mehjui affords layers of meaning um, in this simplistic cinema um, that he creates in this village. There's veiled criticism of blind aspects of religion and ritual. Within the film, there's uh, rituals uh, that are trying to heal Hassan, but it's no, to no avail. Uh, one of the major villagers is called Islam, um, you know, creating um, a notion that, and, and this is the person who always wants to create solutions, but, but cannot. So there's whole ways that the, the story um, can be read, read on a literal sense or uh, in a more layered metaphorical way. Um, the, in, in, the, in the small village society, um, you see the cruel villagers dealing with their village idiots, the jealous neighbors, the indifferent neighbors, the thieves, all elements um, of life, not limited to the village in Iran, but perhaps to um, a universal uh, village. The political layering is not merely limited to poverty, but the politics of hiding truth and the long-term effects it has on society. Hints of political cultural allegory um, are a signature trait of this film and also of much of the um, new cinema that came um, after this. And this film particularly was um, adapted um, after a short story by a uh, writer who had been in prison many times during the Shah's time, Saidi, um, who all, always used allegory in his um, writings to speak about problems within society. Um, and both these films, uh, if we look at the films that have come after them, um, create, have created a kind of language for um, Iranian cinema. Of course, not all of um, this new wave cinema happens in the rural. Many are also urban stories. Um, but you have to realize that um, the films that came in that were visible at the time in Iran were uh, mostly Western imports, and the ones that were done locally were very much um, uh, more based on what, they, what filmmakers had seen coming from the West. So this is a really a new was a new language that, that was created. It is paradoxical that while Iran continues to be one of the most demonized in US media, its films have become now ambassadors of ethics and present a humanistic cinema, which I think this early ones, these early ones really show this as, as the future. To this day, the films of Kirostami, Panahi, or Bani Etimad are examples, and in you, in the U.S., perhaps, the white balloon is the one that's most known. Um, although I, I'm wondering if anyone has seen any of these two that, that we have, um, that I just showed. Okay, so some, some, some of you have, yeah. Um, with Khomeini and the Islamic Republic, a new type of censorship has been established. However, however the cinema has continued to exist and uh, has found ways to deal with the new censors. The old censorship... Was, was a different kind of concerns the censors had. And in, in today's censorship, um, the, the list of things that cannot be done are quite different. Um, mostly they have to do with, uh, well, upfront that women can't be shown, that women's hair can't be shown, uh, or women have to be clad in very um, wide robes and so forth. Um, there's also a notion that the, the government can't be criticized, but Nevertheless, Iranian filmmakers have been able to um, very subtly 
speak about the ills of the society. And at times, not so subtly, and one wonders um, how those films still get made. Um, but uh, can we go to, back to the, to the computer screen, actually? But this notion of stopping um, Western culture was, was a very real one. Um, after, during the revolution, um, people might have heard, some of you might have heard or remember this um, event that, or this tragedy that happened in Abadan um, where Cinema Rex was burned down completely and all the people in it uh, burned as well and died. And Abadan was um, a city in Iran right near the oil fields where the oil field workers worked um, to refine the oil um, and worked in a, in a, with very low wages and where um, the, the um, uh, Western um, representatives of the oil company lived in a very lavish way. So it was these two um, situations side by side. And of course, the oil field workers were very powerful in pushing the revolution at the time forward. But it's something... Um, about maybe 100 some odd cinemas got um, destroyed at the time. And it took really some time to create that distribution venue again um, for, for the new cinema to come. But um, I'm reminded of third cinema. Um, Teshomi Gabriel speaks about it uh, in his book um, and speak, he says that a cinema, it's a cinema of decolonization and for liberation, but I think uh, for Iran, the colonization was not one that um, uh, was, well, perhaps one couldn't label it as such, but the imperialist um, um, experience was profound so that, and so that um, the idea of looking at one's own culture was, was not seen as something uh, worthy, and it had to be reestablished in a way. Um, Just a word about censorship. Um, all filmmaking in Iran has to go through um, the censor bureau and um, will, the scripts and the films will be looked at. Oftentimes, films um, do somehow um, survive the censor bureau, are screened and then censored, then uh, later found uh, guilty, so to speak. Kiarostami says about it, uh, when I think about censorship, I realize that we've always had to face the problem of censorship, not just as filmmakers, but even as citizens of Iran, we've always had censorship. Um, and later on, I want to um, talk a little bit about that in relation to some of the blogospheres that are um, produced in Iran because of the um, because of not being able to express oneself in print so much. Um, that, that has become a very important area where people have a safe space, so to speak, to um, discuss their uh, concerns. So the Iranian filmmakers already worked before the revolution, but perhaps were able to hear... Oh, uh, I guess I said that already, their own uh, creativity much more when um, they were able to um, have a space to do that, whereas before that wasn't so uh, possible. But interestingly, um, there was some government uh, funds also made available, especially on the Khatami, uh, to create um, uh, spaces for cinema making and for art in general. And now it's such that um, Making cinema is not only um, an entertainment, but it almost is a way of migration, if you look at it uh, from the point of view of um, a young woman who was um, a part of a film by Mahmal Baf. Mahmal Baf is a filmmaker who, uh, an Iranian filmmaker who um, was put in prison before, during the Shah's time, 
uh, he, he made films that criticized him and was sort of the poster child of the revolution, but then started really uh, critiquing the, the new government and the new lifestyles. And um, uh, at this point has left Iran because he won't be able to, he can't work there anymore. But many of his films were very critical of the regime. Um, but one of them, uh, when he was still in Iran, is called uh, Salam Cinema, Hello Cinema, where he put out uh, an ad in the paper saying, whoever wants to come and be in my film, come and uh, I will, um, you'll be able to audition. So of course, 10,000 people came um, and lined up in front of his house. And this film, Salam Cinema, uh, interviews some of these auditioners. And one of the young women, um, when asked, why would you want to be in this film? She said that it is a way for me to get out. It's a way for me to um, migrate because I know your film will make it to Cannes, and that way I can leave and um, maybe see um, my lover who now lives in France. So it's become a, a way of uh, hope, um, this cinema. This cinema becomes a cinema of migration just as the tweets and blog entries coming out of Iran have become migrating stories. There's a clip um, that I don't have here. Uh, the Mahmal Baf clip that I just mentioned. Cinema not only as ambassador of peace and communication, but as venue to get um, to other opportunities. And because of that, um, even in small towns and cities, people have been um, starting to engage in making films. Uh, so there's many smaller film festivals now. Um, so it's become uh, not just an industry, but, but a way of working through things, a way of speaking about um, problems, but also a way of imagining a, a migration. Um, documentary film has become a, a new uh, notion lately in Iran, um, in the past 10 years or so. Um, of course, many of the films that came out of Iran in the late 80s, for instance, Close Up, um, mix or create uh, narratives within documentaries or vice versa. And there is often working with non-actors, um, people play themselves. Um, some of these, of course, notions of, of third cinema as well. Um, it's, it's not, films are not created in a studio, films are created um, in the space uh, where people live within their own contexts. Um, but this explosion of wanting to um, tell stories as, as much and in any way possible has been really interesting, um, despite the censorship. Um, I want to show a clip from one of Kiarostami's films. Kiarostami's films, one could say, um, in some ways, are very much influenced by that first film we saw, The House is Black, in that they not only are very poetic, um, but they also use Farukh Farukhzad's poetry, um, and um, there to juxtapose um, urban and suburban realities. And this this one particularly is called the this one that I want to show now. It's called the wind uh, will carry us. <laughs> بچه‌ها <laughs> بله اون که پیداست من زن قهفیچی هم تا نایده بودم 
دیر جانز دیر بته دنیا آمدی بله میگم دیر جانز دیر بته دنیا آمدی پس کی چای جلو دست پدرت میذاره معلوم مادرم پس چرا میگی زن قهوچی ندیده بودم زن همش قهوچی هم دیگه سه شغلان روزا کارگرن قروبه قهوچی هم شوه همه با هم همکاره دوی جان مادر شما خیلی معلوم آقا فستا دفعه پیر بودی ماشین ها را پرک نکن ستا دفعه پیر بودی ماشین ها را پرک نکن ماشین اگر برای آر اگر اگر مهندس پرک کن وقتی به توی ماشین روشن بکنی توی کلگه ایچه چاوی مسافر ایلا گشتی دو نفراتی دنیشی دارم مسافره مجبوریم اگر پرکی کنم I wanted to pick um, parts of these films I mean these are all features so there's many things that happen in them but parts of them that are um, extraordinary in that they have been um, creating discussions among uh, viewers there, but I think also here. Um, they've migrated um, and become uh, very important in terms of humanizing, if that's possible, the image of what um, people in the US, for instance, see in terms of what, what Iran is. And um, besides that, what the Middle East 